Good morning, everybody. I'm John Lowe. I'm Colleen's husband. Uh, Colleen is out of town, so she asked me to get in here and help with the uh, today's discussion. So welcome, everybody. Those of you who are here the, for the first time, we're grateful you're here. Uh, and uh, we're going to move forward. So today we're studying, we've, we've studied Doctrine and Covenants, section 109, verses 1 through 4. And the same talk that we, we discussed last week from the prophet uh, about priesthood keys, uh, paragraphs 21 through 31 of the is what we're focusing on today. So I'm going to open up the discussion and invite, does anybody have anything that they would like to share, things that, that popped out to them? That, that uh, What were your takeaways from this? Yeah, I'm going to throw up a screen share. It's the information. Um, in the first four verses of DNC 109, you know, we, we get in there and it this was all given to uh, Joseph Smith. It was revealed to him, and this is the prayer that was used. In, in verses 3 and 4, it kind of outlines our responsibilities. Part of, part of this time, the saints had been uh, commanded to build a temple. Back in the uh, December of 1832, January of 1833, they'd been just uh, commanded to build a temple. And they hadn't really done anything. So in June 1833, they got chastised a little bit. And you can see this stuff when they, section 88 talks about when they were commanded to build a temple. And then section 95 um, goes in a little bit more about the chastisement. And if you've if you've seen this book, one of the books that, that Colleen and I have on hand, or uh, by Ridges, David J. Ridges, talks about how the the temple, or not the temple, but how the saints were told that they were going to be temporarily in Kirkland, that they were only going to be there for five years, and all of this was coming about, at, at, you know, the temple was dedicated about six months before that five years was up. So uh, Ridges talks a little bit about mortality, how it's a temporary state for us, and how the Kirkland Temple was it, you know, they knew that it was a temporary thing, even though it cost a lot of money and a lot of effort on their behalf. They... Uh, They still went ahead and, and completed it. And think of the, the wonderful things that happened by doing that. Uh, we're going to die if I have to do all the talking. <laughs> so. Hey, I have a quest, a comment. Go ahead, Harry. So, you know, um, there's a lot of really important things that happened in Kirtland. And and we were sitting in the Sunday school and the Sunday school teacher got up and said, nothing important happened in Kirtland. And I was just sitting there because I had taught Doctrine and Covenants in seminary. And I'm like, in, in my mind, I'm like, nothing? Like, there was a lot that happened there that was significant to the church. And it's always bugged me that I didn't speak up and say, you know, that like, hey, there was a temple built. And, you know, as we've looked back, 
and started seeing, you know, as we've looked at this talk and said, hey, look, Jesus Christ appeared. So when you're, if you're out there saying nothing important happened in Kirtland, we can all at least say Jesus Christ appeared in Kirtland. That is not a nothing. Right. And I started to read that book. Um, and it's actually, they mentioned it last week in Inklings. It was by Carl Ricks Anderson. And I, I, I haven't got very far into it, but I was like, I'm really getting kind of pricked that I didn't speak up. So I decided that that's something that I, that was my, one of my takeaways. I need to speak up. If someone's saying nothing important happened in Kirtland, I need to be like more bold and say a lot happened in Kirtland. We just have to learn to do it in a non-adversarial method. Yeah. The, the spirit stays there, right? Yeah. You know, and hey, Moses, Elias, and Elijah all showed up there and restored keys so that the full keys were back on the earth. It wasn't, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it was very important for those things to happen so that we could have the fullness of Christ's kingdom back on the earth, the gospel expanding and growing into all the world. So, so I, have, I have some thoughts, John. Christine, go ahead. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Sorry. I'm doing well. How are you? Left you floundering for a minute. Sorry about that. That's um, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough gig. I think now you, we can all know that Colleen's not kidding when she says this was a hard thing she's doing. I'm really proud of her and grateful. Anyway, um, the thing that stood out to me, I reviewed the talk again this morning and reviewed section 109 again this morning. And the thing that stood out to me is that the Lord has raised a people always, his people always are builders. They leave things for the generations after them. And you look at that in temples, you look at that in temple work, you look at that in not just buildings themselves, but family history and family structure uh, you look at that as the pioneers would cross the plains and they would plant crops, not for themselves as they kept crossing the plains, but for the people that were coming after them. And as I listened to President Nelson's talk and he spoke about how when he was born, I think there were six temples. Now we're in, I think, the 300s. They project by 2040 i've heard this from more than one person that there will be 800 either functioning or in process and i just love that reminder that the lord has called us to be builders builders of our own lives builders of our families builders of other people builders of the kingdom that just is what stood out to me a lot yes that is so true and you know yeah, I've I've heard the same thing. Maybe we heard it from the same sources. Um, and whether it's eight hundred by then or not, it is growing quickly. the The work is is rolling forth, and you know, kind of reminds me of the what you said, the hymn, "We the Builders of the Nations." And, you know, as we we build those temples, we're putting up a light unto the world on the hill, you know, for everybody to see. So does anybody else have anything that they found as they were studying DNC 109 verses one through four and, and President Nelson's talk, Rejoicing the Gifts of Priesthood Keys? As I was going through it, you know, in in, in chat or paragraph twenty one, it's through basically right up through twenty nine. President Nelson's telling us, giving us a lot of uh, promises, and I know, you know, Colleen 
always says she likes to look for the promises. What promises did you see in his talk? That, that Titus ties into section 109 of the, the uh, dedication of the temple. What are we going to receive as we worship and attend the temple more and do more temple work? Um, I, well, from what I got was, um, it talks about a lot in the Doctrine Covenants 109 and also in President Nelson's uh, talk about priesthood keys. And so the whole time that I'm reading it, I'm just, I'm understanding that we have temples and we are, um, I'm trying to think of the word exactly to say, but we are exercising those priesthood keys that have been given to us. And that was the major key that I got that as we go to the temple, as we worship, that we will have a greater understanding of, of what those blessings are from those keys. It's, you know, from baptism, you know, it, it's, it's ceilings, it's endowment, it's all of it. And how, um, I think it's, it's uh, paragraph 16, where he says, uh, President Nelson says, without priesthood keys, none of us would have access to essential ordinances and covenants that bind us to our loved ones eternally and allow us eventually to live with God. Excellent. Does anybody else have something that they'd like to add to that? What is what do keys do? I'm sorry, I'm reading 109. I'm okay. to the part where he's like dedicating the temple and and asking for all the blessings and 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 um the things that could happen if they keep their covenants and come to the temple often and read good books and uplift one another and stuff like that so i'm just quiet because i'm reading okay <laughs> that's okay and, and remember hey michelle this week we're only looking at a small section uh up through verse four one through four. Oh, i didn't so, know that okay yeah yeah so you don't have to read the whole thing we're not all semester we're going to be talking about section 109 oh he is dedicating week, the temple that that is a prayer. He's dedicating mm -hmm. the temple, right? Right. Absolutely. This is the dedicatory prayer from the Kirkland Temple, yes. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. Because mm -hmm. he's just bringing down blessing after blessing after blessing if people keep their covenants in the temple. And, and remember also that this was revealed to the prophet. It wasn't Joseph Smith wrote the prayer. It was came through revelation yes yeah so. you know in, in 21 it, it talks okay i'm gonna go back the prophet tells us this is like a tutorial it tells us that we're going to get answers to prayers and you know i was i've been going through it and it's like holy cow I could just outline everything in here and, you know, we could have, who doesn't want to get answers to prayers or more personal revelation or greater faith, strength, and comfort, you know, increased knowledge and increased power. These are all promises that, that the Lord's given us. And the prophet has reiterated to us that those are things that we can qualify for. Um, John? Yeah, go ahead, Christine. Sorry. I think the thing that stood out to me, I don't know what line it is. Sorry, I don't have my printer because I'm on a long three-week trip going to lots of weddings and graduations. But I have it up on my on my lap, um, laptop in front of me, too. Uh -huh. And it says, we are also, it's towards the end. We are also promised that in the temple we may, and then he puts in, they put in quotes, receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. Imagine what that promise means in terms of having the heavens open for each earnest seeker of eternal truth 
So he says that when we go to the temple, that's one of the promises. If you go to, I think it's uh, well, it's paragraph 24 for those of you following along. Okay, thank you. So I think it's in John 14, 26, but I might have that wrong. I'm pretty sure it's 14, 26, but it might be Luke 14, 26. It talks about the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. And so we know that that's one of the fullnesses of the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost can teach everything to us and bring everything to our remembrance. And the mission they taught us, we think about that from a very earthly standpoint. Like anything we've learned, we can remember if we remain worthy of the spirit. But I believe that anything we've learned, like even beyond before we came here, that the spirit can teach us if we prepare ourselves. So we can understand things of a spiritual nature. We can understand things of the premortal existence. And we see that example in prophets and prophetesses of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the latter days. And so for me, that that I want that, receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. I, I need to work more towards that. I think the Spirit taught me a lot during conference, things I could do better to have that things I could change and shift, maybe uh, my focus, maybe remove some distractions. So that was the, that was the premise that stood out to me the most. And the biggest thing the spirit does is teach us and testify of Jesus Christ. And I, I think we could all, no matter where we're at, have a stronger, better understanding of the savior and his atonement in our life. Thank you, Christine. Yes, that was John 14, 26. Uh, I just read something, you know, how you said that if we go to the temple and we, you know, keep our covenants, you said there's power in that, right? Well, um, and we ask the Holy Father that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power. And that thy name be upon them, and the glory be around them, and thine angels have charge over them. Hello? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right here. Huh? You're talking. Oh, okay. I like that, right? Mm -hmm. We really need that nowadays, you know, with everything that's going on. So President Nelson was saying in um, paragraph 25, how much does it increase our confidence to know that as an endowed man or woman, we're armed with that power of God and don't have to face life alone. It's amazing, isn't it, Donna? Thank you for commenting. Does anybody else have anything else they'd like to add at this point? I, I do too, Uncle John, where um, I think that a lot of times I think with you know, you go through the temple and it just, I think it's a constant reminder that, you know, the temple should be a regular part of our lives. And I love like the keys that it's, you know, it's given the promises to us as well, but we also do have to play our part with that. And I think a lot of people misunderstand that, you know, it's a two-way street, like the keys are given to us, but we still have a responsibility to the keys as well. Right. I like how Thanks. you said that in DMC, Verse one, because it says that, um, thanks be to thy name, O Lord God of Israel. Let's see, um, who keepest thy covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants who walk uprightly before thee, and not just that, but with all their hearts. And I thought, wow, I really walk work on walking uprightly, but am I doing it with all my heart? There's some things to think about there that's that is so true isn't it that there's a lot of there's a lot of meat a lot of information that the prophet shared with us in his his talk um you know oh, yeah. and the conference was fantastic it was so oriented towards Jesus Christ. The temple is oriented to Jesus Christ too. Irene, you had a question or a comment? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about 
sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, that he said, <laughs> he said that the temple was accepted unto him. And I, I just thought about, that's what I want him to say about me. You know, that my efforts of building myself and uh, my life by obeying his word, I want... I want to feel that my temple, <laughs> that that it's accepted. And I want to um, cite something from the guide to the scriptures that's in our, our scriptures. Um, so President Nelson refers to receiving a fullness of the comforter, right? Um, or the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And so... If you look up comforter in the guide to the scriptures, this is what it says. It says, see also Holy Ghost and then a semicolon, Jesus Christ. The scriptures speak of two comforters. The first is the Holy Ghost. And then they have scriptures citing that. The second comforter is the Lord Jesus Christ. When someone obtains the second comforter, Jesus Christ will appear to him from time to time, will reveal the father and will teach him face to face. And I think, I think that goes right along with his promise that he will reveal himself to us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like President Nelson said that earlier in the talk. We covered that last week. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, that is really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I I studied that before, and that had slipped my mind for a while. I love that. One of the other things that. The, I just opened the Rich's book while Katie was talking, and it's interesting that the Kirkland Temple was was dedicated on Palm Sunday, and you know to start a Holy Week, and all of those also Passover and Passover, yeah, all of those promises that that the prophets had been. You know, because they always set the extra plate for Elijah and all those things that happened. It happened. They, you know, they don't always realize that the prophecies have, have been fulfilled. But God wants to give us that power so that we can overcome everything here on earth and return to his presence. It's, you know. It's a place that can help us think celestial. Well, Colleen and I work in the Newport Beach Temple, and when the new temple presidency came in, one of the, I think it was one of the assistant matrons talked about how that, you know, we know the temple is the house of God. And we are going home. It's, it's like a roadmap taking us back to Jesus Christ and God the Father. And every time we step in the temple, we've returned home. So, you know, a, a lot of times, I know, you know, as we grow older, sometimes we grow wiser too. Going to the temple is a pattern for us. And the more we go, and the more people we help progress along the path that have already gone to the other side, the more we're going to be familiar with what happens when we take that transition to go back to God's presence. And uh, it's, it's exciting to see the youth coming into the baptistry. I, I work in the baptistry a lot. And there's one young man from South Orange County that he arranges it almost every week. He's there every week. And he has friends from high school. And they're, you know, I think the smallest group I've ever seen is three. But, you know, there can be 20, 25 kids coming in and doing baptisms and confirmations for those who have passed before us. And his mom asked him why. 
and he said, because it gives me power, he's experiencing some health issues, is my understanding. And he does it because it it rejuvenates him. It recharges his batteries so that he can make it through another week. And it's just amazing what Heavenly Father's put in plan for us and how the, the prophet is helping us focus and see the importance of those things in for each and every one of us. Did, did someone else have something they'd like to share? Donna? Oh, well, I just, on um, paragraph 29, when the prophet says the temple is the gateway to the greatest blessings God has in store for us. So um, I know we are about an hour and 20 minutes away from the temple. And um, I try and go every month. And that, I don't know, on Sunday, I made appointments for every two weeks for the next few months. I thought if I have appointments made, instead of thinking, oh, I need to make an appointment, and then lots of the um, sessions are full, um, I just decided I need to keep appointments made for several months. I'm up through June, I think, so that I it comes up on my calendar and oh yeah, that's that's my temple day and I need to make sure and be there. Can I share something with you? Even if you can't make an appointment, I know in our temple we have 48 seats in the in the uh the uh in Dallas. And well, our, we our do appointments pretty busy, but we do appointments for 40, so there's there's availability for walk-ins too. Uh, yeah. I know an hour and a half hour and a half away, that's you know a, a bigger risk. But I applaud that effort, Donna. Where are you at, Donna? Um, I'm close to Pullman, Washington, so I go to Spokane. Okay. Although the Moses Lake Temple is only two hours away, so um, I made an appointment for there also. Excellent. Well, that's. And the other thing, for those of you who don't know, working in the temple is one, one calling that you can request. You go to your bishop or your stake president, let them know that you'd be willing to work in the temple, and they will process your paperwork and send it to the temple presidency, and then they'll, they would interview you. So I would encourage anybody who can. Uh, working in the temple is one of the best things that, I think Colleen and I have ever done. It's such a beautiful, peaceful place. And it's helping the Heavenly Father and his children do their work. So we just had our stake conference this last weekend, and um actually Elder Gong was here, which meant we only had Sunday morning session. But um one of the speakers was a young lady who just finished her service mission and she did her service mission by serving in the temple. And um I had asked my husband the other day, you know, what he thought about going on a mission. And he said he doesn't feel like that's going to be, he says it sounds like work when he retires, he doesn't want to work. And I thought, well, then I can, I can check into that and see if I can do a service mission from home and working in the temple would be a great way to do that. Yeah. They, um, you wouldn't be considered a service missionary. You'd be an ordinance worker. Right. In fact, I was sitting in a high council meeting a couple of weeks ago, and one of the sisters in our stake, who I very know very well, she's been working the same day we work, but she was working in the office, and they were all called the service missionaries, and she got released, and it's like, I had no idea that she was, she was being released. Well, they they changed that they aren't, they are all ordinance workers now, too, that work in the office. Oh, wow. So they can, you know. They did not do ordinance things as service missionaries. They just were in the office. But now if they are needed, they can pull them in and use them also. So it's it's a wonderful place to be. The spirit is so strong. And you see miracles every time you're there. Okay. Let's, uh, does anybody else have anything that, really stood out to them this week in their studies of the talk and section 109. Well, I would like to share something that's 
I've kind of shared before, um, just that like as you go about your life, there are things that are hard or upsetting or unstabilizing, right? Um, and there, like, like we have a promise that if we keep our covenants, particularly um, the ones we renew when we partake of the sacrament, right? Um, yes. That we have the promise to have the Holy Ghost to be our constant companion. And the Holy Ghost is a member of the Godhood, just like God and just like Jesus Christ. So we literally have a member of the Godhead who is continually with us if we choose to live our life and invite him in. And if we choose to make repairs when we offend. Um, and so while there is a difference between the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, I'm so grateful for the preparation that the Holy Ghost gives me. And since they're one in spirit, I know that I have Christ's power with me as I face the difficulties and know that he is with me symbolically. And I call on that comfort. I call on his presence. I. I soothe myself, reminding me that he is with me. And that soothing goes a very long way to making better choices and showing up for people in a way that's deeply meaningful and helps to build our relationships instead of cause them harm. Thank you, Katie. But, uh, you know, it is. It is important for us to realize, and I think this is part of why the prophet has been focusing on letting us know, think celestial, all those things so much lately. Is the adversary is out there hammering on us all the time that we're not we're not worthy we're not you know you're none of these things mm -hmm. and and it always takes me back you know to moses one where moses had to be transfigured to be in god's presence and he was drained and then you know the adversary comes up and says i'm the god of this world and you get Moses goes, well, why didn't I have to be transfigured? You know, I, I, there's nothing, I don't feel anything special about you. And, but he is so crafty at doing those things. He wants to keep us away from the temple. And the more he does that, the more power he has in our lives. We're giving up our power. We have a, we have a place to go recharge to go be away from his influence and uh, to, to come home, you know? It's like going to your childhood home. Who doesn't like doing that? Some people might not, but, you know, most, a lot of people have good memories about where they grew up because that's what they, you know, they remember. Um, it's, it's beautiful that we have more and more opportunities now. You know, the prophet said, yeah, there were only six temples when he was born. Well, there's a, you know, we're over 300 now in process. And that's so exciting. It, uh, you know, one of the, one of the sisters it was over before conference said, yeah, they make, you know, 800 in that time frame that uh, Christine was talking about. They'd probably have to 
announce about 30 or 40 downloads each time. But hey, 15 is great. Let's 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 keep moving forward. Can I just uh, say real quick? Go ahead, Don. Um, in our stake president, it was a little while ago, but he had talked about um, I mean, because sometimes we can get to the temple, sometimes we can't. But um I think he was talking to the young women, but he said we can all have a place in our home. I mean, it might just be a little chair or a desk or a particular room, um, a place that we dedicate to the Lord, which dedicating um, a, a place is not a priesthood ordinance. Anyone can do it, um, which was kind of news to me, but um, that we can dedicate our place that we study and pray to be our special place with the Lord. And when we need to just have some connection with him and and get away from whatever is pressing in on us, that we can have confidence that that's our place to be with him. And um, several years ago, I wrote a read a book called Calling on the Powers of Heaven that talked about if we're worthy to have the Holy Ghost with us continually. We are worthy then to be with other members of the Godhead also. And what a huge blessing um, idea that was. That It's not just that he's the one here in the fallen plane, but he's still part of the Godhead. Like I think Katie was saying, um, and as we learn how to be in his presence, then we're learning how to be with the Savior and with Jesus, or with the Lord and the Savior. So that's, yeah. we don't, it is wonderful to be able to go to the temple, but when we can't quite get there, we still have places of refuge. Yeah. Well, and it says in the Bible dictionary under temple, that it, the temple is the most holy of any place of worship on the earth. And then it says, only the home can compare with the temple in sacredness. Right. Mm -hmm. So true. That's, uh, um, that makes it more important for us to all be better at home, right? Well, and like, if you live with the spirit and encourage those you live with in your home to live by the spirit, like the communion you experience in your home is, in my opinion, much more sacred than what you experience in the temple with people that you hardly know. When you are able to know each other deeply and respect each other and to apply Christ's teachings, the, the amount of love is so much more intense because it's not just, I love you because you're here. It is that. Um... Or I love you because I like the idea of you. You seem like a good person to be here in the temple. I'm glad you came, right? Um, it's that you actually deeply know their goodness. And you know their struggles. And you love them in a way that you can't love the people that attend the temple. They don't come there for that depth of love the people in your home come to your home for the depth of love that you can offer them there we katie that just triggered a thought and it's it's like we're in a test tube being able to learn and see how heavenly father grows in our home the way you were describing it, Katie. You know, uh, Heavenly Father lost a third of his kids, right? When Satan rebelled. And how do, how do each of us deal with it when one of our children or a spouse or ourselves do something that's not in line with what Heavenly Father wants us to do? But the, and the beauty of it all is he's always there waiting for us to turn back. 
That's what repentance is, is turning and it's an, an about face and, and going back towards God, not moving away from him. We, we move away when we sin and we move back when we repent. And the home, you're right, Katie, is, can be the most special, endearing place. It can also be a very difficult place, but, uh, you know, as all of us grow and and deepen our understanding of what the plan is and how Heavenly Father wants us to be, uh, it can be the best refuge on earth from the storms. John? Yes, Christy. I have, a, I have an experience that goes along those lines. I appreciate everything that Katie shared. I have my own personal testimony of how much our home is a temple. We have seven living children. We lost three children in a row, three babies in a row back in 2012, 13, and 14. Um, and the last little boy had Down syndrome that we lost while I was pregnant. And five weeks later, we got a call about a little baby girl that had been born. Um, some of you, if you've I've been on here for a few weeks with Colleen. You may have seen some of my little girls sit on my lap. I have two little girls with Down syndrome that are Chinese. Uh, we went to the hospital to meet this little girl because her birth mother wasn't sure what to do. She'd been born with a lot of complications and in addition to Down syndrome and needed surgeries. And they decided after about a month that they couldn't take her back to China. They were going to give her up to us for adoption. So we filled out all the paperwork and we took this sweet little baby home from the NICU and brought her home. And my five older children all just were elated and bonded to her. And the next morning we got a call that they changed their mind and wanted to take her back. And so we went back to the hospital, pleaded with them. Um, the reasons they were taking her back were uh, kind of selfish. I won't go into that, but uh, they didn't have a whole lot to do with wanting her necessarily. It was some things that would benefit them. And we begged and pleaded for them not to. And the spirit said to me, as clear as I'm talking to you in my mind, you have to get them back in your home. Your home is the only temple you can take them inside. They weren't members. Um, you have to get them back in your home. And so we took them back. We told them they couldn't take the baby without coming and getting all her medical supplies and all of her stuff and that we'd have to meet with the social worker. So we all went back to our house. Mm -hmm. And when they got there, my son was sitting with her in his lap singing families can be together forever. And he was just bawling. Uh, he was just crying. His little tears were falling on her and they couldn't even bear the spirit that was in the room. They said to our friend that had been translating that was a member, um, we had no idea that the children would bond to her this quickly. And she said, what do you think would happen when they brought a new sibling home to these little kids? Um, but the spirit was overwhelming. And it was such a lesson to me in my imperfections and all the things that we do wrong and all the things that I am right. not, that my husband is not, that my children are not, that the thing that we are doing is trying. And we are trying to make our home a house of the Lord and the Lord provided. So that night after they took her, because they did, we went to the house of the Lord, the actual house of the Lord and prayed and pleaded. And the next morning they changed their mind. And I know that it was the temple I live in every day and the temple that I serve in as much as I can that changed their heart. We have so much power given to us. We, I don't really think we completely comprehend it. The other thing I wanted to share was, he says, finally, we are promised uh, in the end of his talk that no combination of wickedness will prevail over those who worship in the house of the Lord. I have seen that in the lives of my husband and myself and my children, especially my older children. I sent them that promise actually last night. Uh, I was looking at this talk last night as well, and I copied that little part and sent it no combination of wickedness will prevail. That means every 
thing that is wicked will not prevail against us if we worship in the house of the Lord. I just love that promise. Thank you for sharing that, Christine. Um, that was a beautiful experience. Hard one. It's amazing what can happen when we follow the promptings that we receive from the Lord. Because he knows. Thank you, Christine, for sharing that. And one of the things that I was thinking about as you were sharing that beautiful testimony was um, in, in Joseph Smith's prayer, he asked the Lord to accept the house, the workmanship of their hands. And I just thought about these saints sacrificed quite a bit to build this temple. And I think about the things that I that I do to try and make my home a place of, of peace and refuge, like a temple. And the Lord recognizes our sacrifices and he blesses us. And, and we willingly give these things to him. Just as the saints did. And we do the same thing, whether it's a, it's not as extreme as the early saints, but our sacrifice of if we have to drive far, if we have to find someone to watch our children, if it means even going by ourselves or not even being able to enter the temple, but to be there on the temple grounds, that's our sacrifice that we make and, and the Lord accepts them. I really love that part also in verse four, where you talked about, you know, accept the workmanship of our hands. Because a lot of times we think, wow, I'm not really great at whatever it is, you know, a new calling that we get or a prompting that we have or trying to work with our teenagers or, you know, whatever kind of things. But, um, it's kind of like somebody had said, you know, the loaves and fishes, all they had was a little bit, but the Lord made it more than enough. And that as long as we are doing what we're supposed to be doing the best way that we can, the Lord will bless that. That's true. That's That's part of the reason they change some of the questions and they ask, are you striving? Because a lot of people didn't feel that they sh should go in, but everybody who can that feel that is striving to be, do what God has asked us to do, should be able to go in and feast at the Lord's table. Bringing those 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 blessings upon them. Um, I don't know if anybody, you know. I have a little bit more to share. If go ahead, Katie. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, in the last paragraph, in in paragraph thirty one, he says, "Let us rejoice in the restoration of priesthood keys, which make it possible for you and me to enjoy every spiritual blessing we are willing and worthy to receive." Um. And I think um, what Donna was just saying is beautiful too, because um, <laughs> so many times it feels like we are just stumbling. Um, I have had before in my life where more than once I trip and I'm stumbling and I'm running to get out of it to catch my balance and I catch my balance. 
And it's probably like a good eight or 10 steps that I'm like trying not to fall on my face. Um, these happened when I was a kid. So that's why I was able to get back up. Um, <laughs> but um, that, that sensation of stumbling is a little bit exhilarating and it's a little bit terrifying um, because you don't know what's what's happening next, right? Um, and I think that in our callings, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's like we know we have some some capacity. We know we have some inability and um, what's going to happen, right? Um, and I also think that so many of our successes um, not, not because of who we are necessarily, but because of the direction of the Holy Ghost, because of his inspiration, because of his enabling power, Christ's power, reaching down into our lives and helping us to be more capable than we would be on our own. So when we are given a calling, we are also given the priesthood power to perform that calling in our, in our settings apart. Um, and, and it's so good to acknowledge and be grateful for Christ's interference on our behalf and on the behalf of those we are called to serve. And then, um, I also wanted to read just what he said. I don't know if you've already read it, but in paragraph 28, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, here's my promise. Nothing will help you more to hold fast to the iron rod than worshiping in the temple as regularly as your circumstances permit. Nothing will protect you more as you encounter the world's mists of darkness. Nothing will bol bolster your testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and his atonement or help you to understand God's magnificent plan more. Nothing will soothe your spirit more during times of pain. Nothing will open the heavens more. Nothing. The temple is the gateway to the greatest blessings of God sorry, blessings God has in store for each of us. For the temple is the only place on earth where we may receive all of the blessings promised to Abraham. That is why we are doing all within our power under the direction of the Lord to make temple blessings more accessible to members of the church. And then he announced the temples. Um, and I, I, I think that so many of these blessings come from temple attendance, regular temple attendance, but they also come from having made covenants with the Lord. I got to teach my daughter's class in um, primary yesterday, and I talked about how a covenant is a two-way promise. And people know that phrase. It's used pretty frequently. Um, God promises something to us, and we, we promise something to God in return when we make a covenant. But I also described it to them as a two-way choosing. Like, we know that God chooses us, and he chooses each person. That's why he makes baptism and the temple covenants open to everyone through temple ordinances. Each person is chosen. They have the opportunity to receive God through covenant. It is up to the individual to choose God back, to choose to make and keep that covenant. And I have had times in my life where I've had opportunities to make choices. I've had opportunities to choose a person or to choose God. And I'm so grateful that, that I do love God that in those moments. So many moments I was able to choose love of God over anyone else's opinion of me. And that loving God really is a sacred privilege. And by loving God is how we receive so many of the blessings that he promises here. And the covenant blessing is what seals it as ours. We have like a special a special opportunity, a special access, because we have chosen and are choosing, and he is receiving our offering.
Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that. That was that was wonderful. It it is amazing that the promises that that God the Father and our Savior Jesus Christ have put in place for us, and and one of the uh, one of the things that that jumped out, I think it was when Donna was talking. It says, it said, we have to be willing to accept them into our lives. You know, everything's basically done on God's side. It's all up. It's all in our court. We have to accept them. We have to open our heart. We have to have a contrite spirit. We have to make covenants in the temple with them. And then, you know, after we make those covenants, keep the covenants. And the, I guess the big one is enduring to the end. We need to make sure that we endure to the end. Donna? Can I? Oh, go ahead, Donna. Oh. I, I have another quote to read, though. But... Well, great. But I was just going to say, um, a couple of years ago, I had I gave a talk in sacrament meeting about the sacrament. And um, I was just trying to find where it was, and I don't remember, but I... I was really surprised when I was studying for that talk to find um, that our when we make those when we renew our covenants at sacrament, it is not just our baptismal covenants; it is every covenant we have ever made with the Lord. So, um, and that just hit me. I thought, oh, this is a way bigger thing. It's just like I was going to the temple again, or every personal covenant I've made with Him along with their big ones at the sacrament. But what a huge blessing that is to be able to say every week, I am still willing and I'm on your team. I'm willing to do all of those things that I have covenanted to do. And I don't think that's a really well understood because we pretty much all think that it is only baptismal covenant. So. That's why I was trying to find where it was, and I can't find there's, it. Right. Um, there's only I've only heard that quote from an authority, like um, like a general authority, not from a, an apostle or prophet. Um, but I have heard it as well. <laughs> so, and I can try to look it up if you if you do want uh, documentation and, and try to share that with the lows if you want, Donna. That's kind of that's very interesting because that way. Everybody, no matter where they're at on the, the path back, they're able to renew those things. And, uh, you know, I'd never, never heard that before, Donna. Thank you for sharing that. But it makes sense, you know. And the, the beauty of things is the Holy Ghost can can let us know what tr what truth is and uh that just it just fits well into the plan katie you said you had something else you wanted to share yeah so this is from the everlasting covenant by elder nelson or president nelson sorry <laughs> um so he talks about has said which is um mm -hmm. a, a word from hebrew um, which is about God's love. So he says, all those who have made a covenant with God have access to a special kind of love and mercy. In the Hebrew language, that covenantal love is called hesed. Hesed is a special kind of love and mercy that God feels for and extends to those who have made a covenant with him. Because God has hesed for those who have co covenanted with him, he will love them. He will continue to work with them and offer them opportunities to change. He will forgive them when they repent. And should they stray, he will help them find their way back to him. He will never tire in his efforts to help us. And we will never exhaust his merciful patience with us. Each of us has a special place in God's heart. He has high hopes for us. Um, and I think that some of those concepts go really well with Elder Kieran's talk from this last conference, too. Yeah. And we'll get to talk about that later on. I think I'm pretty sure that that's in here. Yeah. 
Well, does anybody else have, Margo, did you have anything you wanted to share with us today? Uh, no, I am. Um, I, I uh, have been very busy and didn't have a chance to do the readings this week. So I have just been patiently listening. We, we are so glad you showed up. And, and we encourage anybody who, you know, yes, time doesn't always permit us to, to study and do those things. Show up because you'll probably learn something. And uh, I know one of the best ways for me to learn things is by hearing it. Uh, we, sure, we sure are grateful for all of you showing up. I think today probably was one of the biggest uh, groups that we've had so far. And uh, we thank you for taking the time to come and discuss our Savior, our Heavenly Father, and the plan that they have to get us home to them. They love us so much. And uh, as we grow and develop and learn how to love like they do, we become more like them. So next week, uh, the talk is Ronald Rasband, Elder Rasband, Words Matter, and Section nine, 109, verses 5 through 8. So we appreciate everybody for spending some time with us this week here. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. May God continue to bless you and your families and watch over you. And as you continue in the covenant path, feel the joy that is there for each one of us. We love being with you and uh, look forward to the next time that we'll be together which will be next Tuesday. So I'm going to, we're going to stop the recording now.